Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Libertarian Brooklyn TV show, Hard Fire. Uh, my name is Dr. Steve Finger and I'll be hosting the show this evening. We're privileged to have as our two guests, uh, John Clifton, who is the Libertarian Party candidate for governor. Uh, John is a social worker, a submarine veteran, a longtime Libertarian, and a previous candidate for the Senate. We also have with us this evening Dr. Donald Silberger. Uh, Dr. Silberger is a professor of mathematics at SUNY New Paltz. He's also a writer, has written several novels. He, Don, uh, Dr. Silberger is a previous candidate for Senate and for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I think we'll start by asking each of our two guests to speak a little bit about themselves and their platform, and then we'll uh, go into a few questions. Uh, John, would you like to begin? Uh, certainly, and by way of peace and freedom, uh, thank you. The grace be with you, and thank you for doing the honors. Um, I'm usually in that chair. Uh, You're not going to sit in my lap, are you? No, no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, I'm a native um, of New York in the sense of I grew up here. I was born, actually, in Georgia. Uh, came up here when I was three, and was settled into the Queens area in Jamaica, Queens. I've been um, very interested in politics and um, political philosophy uh, most of my life, although I didn't arrive explicitly at libertarianism until somewhere along the way. I um, went into um, the, the service as a uh, fire control ballistic uh, technician and worked on Trident and Poseidon class submarines. Uh, left the service to uh, pursue assisting veterans you know, in social work, uh, which evolved into other uh, facets of social work over a, a decade. and. Uh, during that time, really became active in the party uh, and in and, and, and libertarian ideals and in the movement. I ran for Senate in 2000 against Hillary Clinton. Uh, that was uh, quite a experience in itself. And I'm um, now um, endeavoring to help the party uh, bring back freedom to New York uh, by running for governor. Okay, thank you, John. New York certainly can use a little more freedom. Dr. Silberger, would you like to tell us a few words about? Uh you and your platform while you're running? Well, <clears throat> I would say first of all, having been born in Pennsylvania and moved all around the country, I've left a little bit of myself everywhere and brought part of the rest of the country with me. And uh, one of the things I discovered about myself very recently, just before 1990, is that the name I've been giving to myself politically all my life, which is used to be socialist, leftist, was actually libertarian. So the people that I'm attempting to talk to with this show are the people who classify themselves by some other cate categorical name, but who are in fact libertarians as I was, and uh, who may not know it. And I'm not going to try to uh, wheedle around issues uh, in order to uh, appeal to the so-called middle ground, which is usually a ground that has relatively little talk, but a great deal of propaganda behind it. Instead, I'm going to try to talk uh, simple, fundamental ideas in the hopes that uh, others uh, are appealed to by uh, a fundamental, uh, basically reflective and thoughtful approach. I'm going to keep my issues few in number and simple, because I don't expect, as a libertarian candidate, to get much of a hearing. We don't usually get covered by the media. I'm listening, John. And uh, we don't have too much time to say what we have to say. My main issue in New York State is that the United States incarcerates a larger number and a larger percentage of its citizens than any other country on Earth. I do not consider it an honor for our country to be the gulag champion of the world, mm. and I oppose it. And okay. my issue, therefore, is that issue which has incarcerated more people unjustly than any other rec in recent times in this country, and that is the drug war. Mm -hmm. Well, that's as good a place to begin as any, and uh, uh, libertarians traditionally have had very strong feelings about drug, drug laws and the drug war. And we're all well aware 
of the fact that there is a distinction between the effect of drugs and the effect of the drug laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're seeing now is actually the confluence of both of them. And I know, John, that you have something to say about that, that you would like to make some changes in the drug laws for that oh, reason. Oh, certainly. Uh, that is a, one of the standard issues that have been perplexed uh, and, and captivated libertarian minds for um, generation now. Uh, the way to bring back freedom to New York in the area of drugs is to take a comprehensive approach uh, at, at, and, un and understand that people who are average people who are not in prison or no relatives who are in prison, uh, but the regular population uh, should be made more aware of how they are affected by uh, the insane war on drugs and drug prohibition. Uh, the nature of the law itself has started to be distorted in, in the nature of government, where judges are supposed to be independent of the legislature and the executive branch. But the Rockefeller drug laws, for example, uh, take away discretion from judges that should be uh, there, in case, so if a lady is standing before a judge at, on a drug charge solely because her boyfriend slipped something in her bag, and she had no mens rea or guilty mind or intent to commit any mm -hmm. infraction, uh, even if she disagrees with the law, uh, the judge should have the discretion to say, oh, this is what happened, so give her a tap on the wrist or whatever, but under the laws, um, simple possession requires X amount of years. The judge so has to just do so that feel sentence that, out. That that first of all, there's, in, there's a question as to whether we should be regulating and illegalizing drugs to begin with. And second, mm -hmm. secondly, if we, if we do accept that premise, should the laws be as draconian as they are right at right. the time? Right. Uh, there's some, some meager attempts to tweak the Rockefeller drug laws. The problem is the Rockefeller drug laws. Uh, it, and, and, and eliminating them is a, clearly a sound first step towards getting rid of this whole ridiculous um, drug prohibition. Uh, other aspects of the drug issue that should be um, taken into effect is that we should protect marijuana users who are using it for, uh, at least for medical marijuana purposes. I mean, good grief, the National Christian Coalition it supports uh, medical marijuana. So why can't a governor exercise powers that he already has in New York mm -hmm. to help protect people who, are, who need pain relief? I mean, whatever one thinks about the war on drugs, let's get patients out of the way sure. and allow them to access to an efficient means of uh, pain relief. Um, the, some of the opponents of this kind of idea would say, well, let's just use uh, Marinol, which is a prescription drug version of the THC in marijuana. Um, that drug costs 30000 bucks a year. You know, uh, hmm. that, that it's, it's much more expensive than um, the illegal substance uh, that's supposed to be um, expensive. Uh, it's actually very cheap. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's an efficient way to, um, for people who are suffering, from, who have gone through chemotherapy and other kinds of uh, pain uh, to relieve themselves of, of, of those problems. Uh, I also I just want to add um, that one issue that people don't normally think of as a drug issue, but it's a substance, has to do with uh, cigarettes, which were recently been uh, banned from restaurants. Mm -hmm. I'm for repealing the restaurant ban uh, on smoking and allowing people to smoke whatever it is they want to smoke. Mm -hmm. um, let that decision go back to businesses and to customers where it belongs. So you feel that the, uh, the owner of the business should be the one to make the decision? Yes. And, and then the, customers can either come to their business or they could leave the... They could, the uh, customers, the market should be the regulators mm -hmm. of what happens to institutions that allow smoking and not right. um, some regulators who've decided that that's, this activity is too unhealthy. What next? Okay. Skateboarding mm -hmm. um, made illegal? Because people who trick off or whatever get injuries? Mm -hmm. And medical marijuana, you should, that should be a decision left to the patient and his doctor, especially in yeah. terminal, there are terminally ill cancer patients mm -hmm. who are, use marijuana to prevent the nausea and vomiting from, mm -hmm. uh, from chemotherapy, yes. and AIDS patients who are going through these terrible wasting mm -hmm. situations because they can't, they lose their appetite, and that we know that is improved by medical marijuana. Yeah. By and marijuana. What, a main, uh, what a humane governor can do mm -hmm. is enforce and protect medical marijuana and, and patients' right to use that mm -hmm. as one option for pain relief. So as governor, you, you, would, you would be loath to enforce laws against medical marijuana? Correct. Okay, I guess you agree with that also, Dr. Silberger. Uh, I would uh, agree with that, certainly. Uh, I think that all the points that uh, the next governor of New York State, John Clipson, has been making are good points. Uh, I think that there is obvious injustice in the application of the law. Injustice in what way? 
well, injustice in the sense that the poor can't get a very good hearing. Those mm -hmm. who are well off and can afford uh, expensive attorneys don't go to jail no matter what they've uh, been involved in, whereas uh, those who are uh, nailed for possession mm -hmm. with a, enough substance for conceivable sale uh, might be salted away in prison for decades. Mm. So that would certainly be a situation of injustice. The stupidity of the laws is another question. There's injustice in stupidity itself. Uh, the idea is that people are going to pre prevent it from engaging in an activity by making uh, the consequences of, of that activity uh, much more uh, dangerous and harmful than the activity could conceivably be by itself. Uh, as if, for example, uh, the smoking of marijuana uh, on a regular basis is going to harm somebody more than being kept in a steel box for 20 mm -hmm. years would harm that person. Mm -hmm. So, if so people you feel the laws are actually more dangerous than the substances themselves. And the enforcement thereof and the enthusiasm <clears throat> for incarcerating people and for creating a society which lives off, off a prison system mm -hmm. and uh, lives by incarcerating more and more people. Now, I would ask my boss, John Clifton, when he's governor, to appoint me as uh, head of a commission to review prison sentences of people in jail in New York State. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be that those people who have caused no harm to anybody, that anybody's going to complain about, and have killed nobody, have not robbed anybody, have not defrauded anybody, have exchanged for money or otherwise substances or materials which both parties to the agreement find acceptable and the terms acceptable, those people do not belong in jail. Violent criminals belong in jail. Murderers, rapists, assaultants, and people who commit fraud, people who steal pension In other words, you, you would be in agreement that we should not be, not be uh, pursuing victimless crimes. Correct. That's, crimes a, which that's there a really general is no. idea. Right. Yeah. Well, what do, what do you say, just to play the devil's advocate, what do you say to people who's, who, who uh, believe that if drugs were to become legal, they would become much more widely used, much more widely available, and the children might begin using them. If we legalize drugs, does that mean that children would be able to use drugs also? Uh, let me deal with that a little bit. First, um, when, when were the problems greatest, before the laws occurred or afterwards? My suggestion would be that both the effects of the law of, of the abuse and the extent of the abuse has increased after the laws were created. Mm -hmm. Just as hard, uh, just as hard liquor was produced largely in the United States as a consequence of alcohol prohibition between 1919 and uh, 1932, uh, and hard liquor is a little harder on you than uh, wine or beer, which was the which were the beverages of choice before. Uh, such substances as crack are basically a creation of the drug war itself. It's a it's a sort of a the sort of sub thing that you can uh, indulge in in a corner rapidly rather than in the comfort of your home with your friends. And uh, in this way, it became popular. I would add um, that the, my understanding is in certain countries where there has been more liberal uh, drug law uh, or decriminalization of certain drugs, as in Amsterdam, uh, violence against um, children, women actually went down. Mm. Uh, and, and there's no real correspondence between drugs and substances themselves and um, violence or, or exposure to um, sensitive populations. It, there is a problem when you take uh, a substance that is, n or a set of substances that mm. shouldn't have been banned or marginalized the way they, these recreational drugs have and connect them to the black market, which is going to be a criminal market by its very nature um, because it's, it's not operating under the law. You separate drugs from the black market, the way alcohol was separated from the black market with the end of prohibition, and the problems associated with drugs and the black market go away. Uh, I, I would also mention one practical aspect of depopulating the prisons of nonviolent offenders, uh, most of whom are in there for nonviolent drug offenses, is that you save an awful lot of money. Uh, that, that, that's where I would like to turn to the fiscal issues. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that is done to prosecute and regulate victimless crimes uh, that create um, overhead for this state and federal government. Uh, they're eliminating a lot of these um, bureaucracies and um, regulatory um, uh, 
hassles, loopholes, not loopholes, but, um, but institutions would help create um, revenue to function government um, and, and allow us to pr pursue comfortably you know, with tax relief in many of the areas that where it is surely is needed, such as capping property taxes, uh, especially so in the you're saying Island. part of the problem with the drug laws is that we're wasting so much money right. with all the huge bureaucracies. Yeah, and, and the, there's <clears> a connection between our wasteful overextension in that area and, 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 and the bloated bureaucracy that is the commanding so much, presumably so much tax revenue from the public. I would recommend eliminating state income taxes, uh, as well as capping property taxes throughout New York. That would cover the basis in terms of bringing freedom back to New York in terms of people's property remaining in their pockets, their, their money. Uh, the way in which this would um, assist the state is that more money would be in the private economy to help grow the economy in New York versus to being okay. siphoned off. I'm going to ask government. you, uh, John, if you could just hold that thought for one second because we'd like to uh, introduce a small public service announcement. Uh, the gravest issue facing America today is not the war on terrorism, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, nor is it education, health, or crime. It's the war on freedom. Americans should not have to live in fear of government as they do now. Government is supposed to be our servant, not our master. If you're interested in joining the fight to restore our lost freedoms, meet with Brooklyn Libertarians. We meet once a month. Go to upcoming.org and search on Brooklyn Libertarians to find out when and where we meet. That's upcoming.org and key in Brooklyn Libertarians in the search box. I hope to see you at our next meeting. Okay, now, John, you were telling us uh, before my rude interruption mm -hmm. that uh, you'd like to eliminate uh, state income tax. Yes. Uh, what spending, obviously that's going to take a big bite out of the budget, so what what, would, what spending would you like to eliminate to compensate for the, the income Well, tax? as you know, libertarians oppose most uh, forms of, of government bureaucracy and laws as being intrusive of freedom, which we mm -hmm. think is the self-ordering principle. Uh, it, it, freedom is a self-ordering or, or, uh, organizing principle of society that you leave people to do these things themselves and they will take care of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need bureaucrats and micromanagers or a managerial state uh, running things. Uh, you eliminate a lot of these bureaucracies. Um, that's eliminate the need, the, need for tax the, revenue. The drug, in the first place. The drug bureaucracy is being a prime example. One of that. example, and the prison complex as well. The other thing about this is, is you need to understand is that the budget itself is only part of the picture. The whole um, asset profile of the state is another. There, there's there's trillions of dollars in assets that mm -hmm. state and federal governments have, apart from what money they get in year to year in tax revenue. You could, it's been broken down years ago. In New York State, if you take the, all the property and assets New York State owns and divide it up, you, it comes to roughly $3,000 for every man, woman, and child in New York. Wow. You could actually refund that money to people. Uh, it, you could actually save a lot of money also in terms of the institutions that were. Or, or Are you talking about selling real estate that the state owns and selling and houses? Assets that of that, of that nature. A lot of the a lot of the, the cost of government in the state is upkeep of those mm. of that real estate and, and resources, and that would go back to the private sector. That they would be their problem, uh, you know. And and therefore you could have um, a lot of money and wealth, and property restored to the private economy to be, rebuild and and make New York State thrive. Right. In other words, you're saying that if we had a smaller government a less intrusive government, mm -hmm. it would be a lot cheaper for the people in New York State. Yes. That we would be able to lower their taxes, they'd have a better life without mm -hmm. sacrificing and have a little more money right. into their pocket. I think most, most of our viewers would be in favor of that. Just one other thing, um, that one other aspect of the tax issues I'm promoting is the right to petition, which is people have a right to withhold taxes if they have grievances of the, of the magnitude we're talking about. Uh, whether it's regarding um, fiscal waste, Federal Reserve, Patriot Act, whatever it is, they have a right to withhold taxes and that will be protected by this governor uh, until their questions about the misuse of money by the government and, and misuse of power is answered properly by the state and federal government. But you're not saying individual taxpayers could just withhold their taxes uh, at, at their own discretion? if they don't feel it's being spent properly. That is the fundamental right of a 
republic, that popular sovereignty. That is what the substance of the declaration was about, that they were withdrawing their support for the British crown and, and demanding separation uh, based on the tyrannical actions of the British government. And that, that's what the founders understood to be the bedrock of popular sovereignty that makes a legitimate republic. If we don't have that power, we don't have a republic anymore. And so I'm, I'm supporting that and upholding that right as governor. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Dr. Silberger, did you want to add well, something to that? <clears throat> Whereas some of the spirit of what uh, John has been saying about uh, the tax situation in the country, I, I, I tend to support. I don't feel that I understand enough about the economics of the, of the, uh, of the country and the way, the way in which the institutions have to function, how they have to be funded uh, to deal with that. Besides that, uh, since it's extremely unlikely that I'm going to be in a position to influence this very much, I'd prefer to have people reflect on uh, what, what might be accomplished by voting for a couple of guys who are extremely unlikely to get elected to the offices which they seek. And that's uh, John Clifton and myself. Libertarians generally get under 1% of the vote. Mm -hmm. In fact, in this particular election, if we got 1.4% of the vote, am I right there, John, 50,000? Something like that. Uh, then we become an official party, which means that we don't have to expend all of our exceedingly limited resources and time begging people for signatures in order to uh, have our names and our party's name printed on the ballot so that you, uh, the voting public, have an opportunity to vote for us if you so choose. Instead, we can push our issues. And I would like to return to the issue uh, that I had uh, been mentioning before. I want to intrude the aspect of corruption. I believe that the drug well, just, war... Just before we get off this one thing, you raised an interesting point there, Dr. Silberger. So what you're saying is that people should be more likely to vote, should, should tend to vote for third parties, because many people say that their vote is actually wasted when they vote for a third party. When actually you're saying it's just the opposite. Your, it's vote, wasted. your vote is wasted when you're voting for one of the sure winners, particularly right. in, a, in a race like the present one, where almost anybody who's paying attention to what's going on knows that Spitzer is going to win between 63 and 66 percent of the popular vote, and it's almost certainly going to be governor of New York State, regardless of how you vote. So you're saying that the individual voter can actually have a greater impact by voting for a third party whose platform he agrees with rather than just voting for one of the, the major parties because he's for, more inconsequential. That's a very good point because it, it counteracts a lot of the arguments that we've had a fight with over the years By voting for a third party that you agree with, mm -hmm. whose point of view you support, your vote counts between 50 and 100 times as much as your vote counts if you're voting for a major party candidate. That's right. You are of a minuscule influence mm -hmm. on the general outcome of this election if you throw your vote into the black box of one of the duopoly parties. Mm -hmm. Those two employment agencies that swap power back and forth and pretend to compete with so each other. So you're saying a voter could actually have a greater impact by voting for a, a, a third party, contrary, contrary to what most people believe, they figure that their vote is wasted. You're Correct. saying it's, vo it's wasted when they vote for the Democrats and Republicans and can have greater impact by voting for a third party. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point of view. I don't think anybody would argue with that. I, I would Nobody also add anyway. the other major dimension of this is upon, especially upon our party having permanent ballot access um, and upon mm -hmm. getting that visibility, then uh, the public has a place to go for unique issues that only our party addresses, such as eminent domain abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the party that's held demonstrations um, uniquely to protect people from land grabs of various mm -hmm. type, um, especially land grabs by the government um, that, that benefit other private entities, um, whether it's the Rat right. Bruce Ratner and Net Stadium. Right. In, in so, some of our Florida. voters, some of our viewers might not realize exactly what we're talking about with eminent domain. Mm -hmm. Originally in this country, eminent domain was, was the right to take property for public use in the Fifth Hospitals, Amendment. Is that roads. right? public use, but now with the, with the Kelo decision, mm -hmm. it's been public, uh, a public benefit. Yeah. And that basically has given governments on all levels the right to take property for anything that they mm -hmm. want to take, like the Atlantic Yards. And upstate, uh, there is a power uh, transmission company, um, NYRI, <coughs> that's been attempting to get federal um, domain powers so they can run a transmission line across the state for mm -hmm. 70 different communities, just take away 
homeowners and farmers um, land for across 70 different uh, counties upstate uh, and communities, excuse me. Uh, and that's the same kind of nonsense where, you, where, where the, the property goes from private citizens it's taken by the government and given to other private entities. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a crazy merge of eminent domain abuse and corporate welfare because it benefits corporations that, that they couldn't get it the fair free market way. Right. Um, Should be purchased. You wouldn't have any objection to mm -hmm. what they were doing as long as it was purchased on the free mm -hmm. market. So I'm saying our party is addressing the needs of, of, of restoring property rights and, and protecting them. Uh, and also, uh, whether it's uh, protecting homeowners from being hammered by property uh, taxes in this state mm -hmm. or uh, eminent domain or um, Katrina laws. Um, okay. Some states have passed Katrina laws that say in an emergency um, we have a right to take your guns. Okay. Uh, we're, we're for t we're John, I don't, want, I don't want to cut you off on this, but we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time here. Mm -hmm. I know there's a few other issues you wanted to talk about, and mm -hmm. I think for most people the, the major issue, or one of the major issues, is the, the poor quality of education in certain neighborhoods here. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have some feelings as to how the education system should be changed as far as school choice or yes, people I think we should have a maximum amount of choices uh, for our youth to educate mm -hmm. them. Uh, and that means separating our minds, uh, uh, in our minds, government and education. Mm -hmm. We should look at, explore all you know, avenues that will Give properly parents separate the, the them. choice to send their kids th to a private right. school. Private schools, promote homeschooling, tuition uh, tax credits. Right. Uh, and um, where they make sense with our principles, where we can find a way to make that happen, uh, we can Talk about we options. know that in New York, the, the government is spending $15,000 per child, mm -hmm. and I assume that you feel it could be spent better in other ways. Yes, and, 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 <clears throat> and some courts are even trying to mandate to the, to the legislature that it be spent, okay. uh, you know, even more be, money be spent. And, that, and I think it's ridiculous, and we should separate state from school and school mm -hmm. from state. I can give parents more of a choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this has been really a very interesting and exciting half hour, and I'd like to thank our guests. John Clifton, who will hopefully be the next governor of New York State, hopefully. and Dr. Donald Silberger, who will hopefully be the next lieutenant governor of our state. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed our, our, the half hour here, and we've given you something to think about. And so until next week, uh, thank you very much for tuning in and for watching uh, Hot Fire. Founding father said, live free or die, not live for free or die. <laughs>